the former Sonia Cottle married John West, which is indeed fortunate for John West. John West did us a, a great favor in moving Sonia West to this congregation so we can employ her as the church secretary. I don't know how good John is, but Sonia is just absolutely wonderful. <laughs> John was born in Abiding, Mississippi. His father and brother and, and uh, father-in-law are all gospel preachers. Uh, he and Sonia, of course, have three children, two of which are here. Uh, Lauren, Jonathan, and Joshua. He's preached full-time in Mississippi and Alabama. He's conducted uh, gospel meetings and lectureships in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Michigan, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas. He's participated in mission trips to the island of Grenada and, and to uh, uh, England. He graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching in 1989 and Faulkner in 91 with a B.A. in Bible and Fried Hardin uh, in 2000 with a master's degree in ministry. He's current instructor for the Truth Bible Institute. He works in the secular field and preaches uh, for the Dayton Church of Christ in Dayton, Texas. He is speaking to us on good old Noah. He built the ark just like I built the ark just like he was told to. You gotta be kidding. You gotta be kidding. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. So we certainly want to uh, listen to what he has to say, and so John can speak to us. Thank you, Ken. When Ken introduces you, you never know what's going to be said. <laughs> but that's okay. I do appreciate this privilege to be here with you today. It has been regrettable I haven't been able to be here during the day. Working in the secular field does take me away from that. That is one of those unfortunate situations, but it's one of those necessary evils. Put food on the table. <laughs> so I do enjoy what I do in the secular field, but more importantly, I enjoy doing, uh, preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that I have that privilege each Lord's Day at the Dayton Church of Christ. It's about an hour east of here uh, to continue that preaching. Been there now for about three to four months. We only turn our attention today to the topic that is at hand. When David assigned me the topic, we're simply talking about Noah's flood or the worldwide global flood. And then when he sent the actual topic to me, I already knew what I was doing. It had this title to it. Good old Noah built an ark like God told him to. And then he, always, he had to put that at the end. Are you kidding me? But there's a lot of truth in that. We're dealing with a world today that denies the global, universal, worldwide flood of Noah's day. However, this is one of the greatest events in the history of the world. Man may deny, and there are skeptics who disbelieve in the Bible, or at least disbelieve in the flood of Noah. I've talked to people who say they believe in the Bible, yet believe this is a fable. We're going to discuss today and determine whether or not this is a fable based on evidence. It's easy for us to say a lot of things. I can say a lot of things about someone, but if I don't have the evidence to back up what I'm saying, what good is the words that I'm using? No good at all. I engaged a discussion with someone where I'm currently working about this particular subject because they know that I'm a preacher there, and this particular person asked about my subject and what I've been writing about and what we're planning on doing. I said, the flood. And this gentleman said that he didn't believe in the flood, but he believed in the Bible. After a short discussion, then he decided he might want to read my material because he couldn't answer what I was saying. So I gave him a manuscript. I said, read this manuscript. And that was three or four months ago that I gave that to him. And he said yesterday, he, we're talking about the lectures here, and I told him about speaking today. Oh, you're going to speak on it. He said, by the way, I finished reading that. That's good material. That was the end of the conversation. But we're dealing with people in the world who, even though they say they believe in the Bible, they often deny the flood of Noah's day. But because of the sins of mankind, God brought this great deluge upon the world and destroyed every living creature, save Noah and his family from the face of this earth. In Luke chapter 17, 
verses 26 and 27, Luke records, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Notice what is recorded in the book of Luke. This flood came and destroyed them all. It destroyed this entire world. We're going to notice today in the lesson that Noah did build an ark to God's specifications just as he, said he was told to do in Genesis chapter 6. When the ark was completed, animals were led into that ark and saved from that flood along with Noah and his family. As I mentioned, it is often argued and scoffed at that the ark uh, did not take place, or the flood did not take place, the ark was not built, but some often scark, uh, scoff as well that the animals could not fit into the ark. It wasn't big enough. Well, we're going to notice that there was plenty of room in that ark with room to spare. When this thing completely ended, or when the flood ended, uh, and the animals came forth from that ark, that there was no problem for them being in that ark for that year. I want to notice, first of all, in our lesson, the pre-flood conditions, uh, the way the earth was prior to uh, the flood of Noah's day. The world prior to the flood was totally different than the world we see today. The pristine condition upon which uh, Noah, or rather Noah and his family, as well as those prior to that, from Adam and Eve to Noah, lived, was likely that of a tropical paradise. Evidences in the Bible show that it did not likely rain upon the earth prior to the flood. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. This was recorded prior to God putting man upon this earth, but recorded in Genesis 2 after God said he made man in his own image, but he's showing there wasn't a man prior to this to till the ground. But notice in this passage that God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Now, this was during the days of Adam and Eve. However, there are evidences to show that this condition continued until the time of the flood. The conditions from the time of Adam and Eve to the flood didn't change. The world was a lush garden and watered both from a mist coming from the earth as well as a water vapor canopy in the heavens. It was a warm climate with very little variation in the temperature. We don't see the... We, they didn't see the changes as we see today. Sonia was remarking just earlier how, you remember Sunday, Sunday night? It was cool here. Woke up this morning, it was rather warm, wasn't it? It's been warm throughout this day. We have a variation in temperatures. It'll go from hot to cold. It might be sun shining one minute, the next minute, as we say, raining cats and dogs, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, winds, hail, all sorts of things can happen during that time. They didn't see these kind of conditions during that day. Notice this quote, that it was a lush garden, tropical from pole to pole. The canopy model of a watery layer above the Earth's atmosphere is the best way to understand how this is possible. The scriptures tell us that God separated the waters from the waters on creation day two and placed the waters above the Earth. The increased atmospheric pressure would have allowed large amounts of condensation at the end of each night cycle. This was a very heavy dew along with the mist that would have been adequate to water the ground so there was no need for rain upon the earth. So we can see that there was no need for it to rain upon the earth during that time. We can go further. When Noah was implored of God to build the ark, we know that it was still in this pristine condition. However, because of the wickedness of man, God decided that it was time to cleanse the world of sin. And in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his heart, or of his thought of his heart, was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man upon the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. When God saw the wickedness of man, he determined to destroy this world. But we remember in verse 8 of this same chapter, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And because of Noah's faithfulness, which we can read not only in the book of Genesis, but as recorded forever in time in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the great faith of Noah and the great life that Noah lived, that God decided to spare him and his family and destroy the rest of the world. 
But in 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, God spared not the old world, saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in a flood upon the world of the ungodly. The world in which they were living was an ungodly world, and God decided to destroy the world. In 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 20, when sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. God was long-suffering. And his long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while he prepared that ark. It is thought to have taken about 100 to 120 years for Noah to build that ark. And when that time was completed, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives entered the ark with the animals that God sent to him and the world was destroyed by water. Those eight souls, as well as those animals, were all saved in this ark. What about the ark? What about the specifications? What kind of ark was it? Now when we start thinking about the ark, and we start thinking about the size of this ark, this was one monstrous boat. This was a large boat. I started to include some slides that I didn't, but you can find some on websites. I've seen one website that has a school bus next to it. And it looks like one of these little bitty yellow toy school buses that little kids run around and play with compared to that ark. I've seen another picture of a, a replica of the ark with a one-story house next to it. That house looked like a little Lego house. A little small thing compared to that big, huge ark. Someone in the Netherlands, and you can Google this, built a replica of the ark. It's pretty interesting when you see it. Now, I know there are some things in it that would not be biblically accurate. One of those and extra things, which he has it for uh, as a museum, so to speak, and has it for people to tour. So he has to have more light in it than what Noah could have had in the ark. So he has some things that are not exactly as the Bible taught, but primarily... He's done a pretty good job, it looks like, as far as the description we read in the Bible, but he tried to build it to the exact specifications of the Bible. And, of course, since no man knows what the inside was like, other than it does tell us it had three floors, we'll go over that later, uh, we don't know how that was laid out, but there are some artist renditions, and plus he had his own rendition of how he thought it could have been. Those things are going to be guesswork, but we do know that it was big enough to carry all the animals. The displacement in this ark and tonnage, which is the weight of water which would displace at a drought of 15 cubits would be more than 22,000 tons. Rather large boat, isn't it? The ark's total volume would have been at least 1,518,000 cubic feet. 1,518,000 cubic feet. Think about how large that is. This would equal the capacity of about 569 modern stock cars, railroad stock cars. The standard size for a stock car is, a, is approximately 44 feet long with a volume of 2,670 cubic feet. This would make a train more than five and a half miles long. The floor space for the ark would be approximately or over 101,000 square feet, which would equal more than 21 standard college basketball courts. 21 of them to even come close to what the ark was. The ark was built on a ratio of 1 to 6. And with this ark on the ratio of 1 to 6, it equals 50 cubits by 30 or 300 cubits. The science of even naval uh, architecture reveals that the most stable ratio for a boat to be on the wide open seas is exactly that, a 1 to 6 ratio. All modern ocean-going vessels use this same length and width ratio. That's interesting. Now, there are some who say that Noah and his ark was all a fable. How could Noah, or why would even Noah, come up with these type of specifications? If God had not told him this, this was all a fable, none of this that you read in Genesis chapter 6 is true, then how could this writer come up with these specifications to which now all ocean-going vessels pattern themselves or are patterned by these architects. Very interesting, isn't it? Well, let's go further. How did Noah get all these animals in the ark? Did he have to go out and search for them, go through the woods and, 
and round up a few and uh, I guess like some of these cowboys in Texas with a lasso and lasso them and pull them in, dig in the ground and get him some worms and the little insects and try to figure out which one he needed to find. Is that the way it happened? How did he get all these animals in the ark? Well, concerning the animals, Noah was told by God in Genesis 6.20, of the fowls after their kind, and of the cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort, notice this, shall come unto thee. Two of every sort will come unto thee. It didn't say that he had to go out and look for them. God sent the animals to Noah for him to put in the ark. Well, we could go even further. We start looking at this ark, and we already mentioned uh, concerning the size of the ark. How could the ark contain all of these animals? How could we see these animals, especially when you see dinosaurs, and you think about dinosaurs, you think about the big elephant or the giraffe or those big animals. How could he get those big creatures in a boat? There are a lot of them around, or at least the dinosaurs were. Look at the elephants. There are a lot of large elephants. How could he get them in there? Well, there's a misconception of how the ark could contain all the animals. Not only the size of the animals, but look at the various breeds of animals as well. And someone said, well, he couldn't fit all the animals in there. Uh, but, but if you notice in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible states that he wants to put two of every kind of unclean and seven of every kind of clean animal in the ark. Of kind. What's a kind? What's he talking about when he mentions the word kind? There was no reason to put two of every species or seven of every species in the ark, or of every breed, rather, in the ark. Just think about it. Why would he put two poodles, two chihuahuas, two bulldogs, or whatever kind of dog you might find? They'll say, well, he couldn't put all those dogs in the ark. The Bible says that he put two of every kind. That means he put two dogs, not two of every breed of dogs. But well, people have a misconception when it comes to having the animals in the ark. There are only a few large animals, such as the dinosaur and the elephant, that Noah would even have to be concerned with getting them in the ark. And these could be represented by very young animals. But we often discount as well the power of God. If God gave Noah the ability to build this ark and told him he was going to put all these animals in there, could not God sustain these animals in this ark? Think about it. People start questioning the intelligence of God, even those who say they believe in the Bible or believe, even believe in Noah and the ark. Some question how many animals could have gone in the ark. They're questioning God's intelligence. If God was smart enough to make this world, don't you think he's smart enough to put a few animals back in a boat to save them? And he could also put small animals in. Who's to say it had to be a big, huge T-Rex that was full-grown? Could it not have been a small one, a newborn? And if God put them in there, could they not, in essence, hibernate for a period of time? Or could he not keep them from growing for a period of time if they put small ones in? You see, we're looking at a normal situation in life. But this wasn't normal. This was different. And when God had Noah build this ark, and had him put these animals in the ark. God could sustain these animals in the ark as well. But assuming the average animal to be about the size of a sheep, and that is about the size of a normal animal, even the size of a normal dinosaur, we think about the T-Rex or uh, your brontosaurus or apatosaurus is the official name, some of the long tail dragging dinosaurs, those were very few and far between, folks. Even among the dinosaurs, the average size dinosaur is said to have been about the size of a sheep. And if you use that as an average for a sheep, using a railroad car for comparison, we know that the average double-deck stock car can accommodate 240 sheep. One car could accommodate 240 sheep. Thus, three trains hauling 69 cars each would have ample space to carry 50,000 animals, and that would still only fill 37% of the ark. That's only a little over a third of the ark would be filled if you put 50,000 animals in. And it's estimated there were only about 16,000, 17,000 animals that was even needed. And that's even a liberal estimate. But if you want to go to the most liberal estimate, it even say 50,000 animals, only a third of the ark, a little over a third of the ark would be filled. This would leave an additional room for 30, uh, 361 rail cars, enough to make five trains of 72 cars to carry all the food, 
and the baggage plus Noah and his family. The ark had plenty of space. There's no problem with the space in the ark. But how could Noah care for all the animals? According to the Bible, the ark had three floors. Now this is an artist's rendition of the ark. You had your three floors, your first, second, third. There could have been various ways it was laid out. This artist's rendition, he says the food and water storage could have been on the ends. Plenty of room for that. Thus, as it goes down that length of the 450 feet, wherever each animal was that would eat a certain type of food, he could have that food laid out on each deck. Stairs to go up and down, no problem whatsoever. Here would probably be the ventilation system. You know, in houses, when they're built in the very top of the roof, it's not solid. There are ventilation systems in houses to keep it from overheating in the attic. You think God wasn't smart enough to have Noah build something that would provide adequate ventilation? Someone said, has said before, well, because all the methane gases these animals were released uh, in their waste, that it was impossible for them to survive. It would kill them smelling the methane gas. Well, there's a lot of ways to take care of this. Number one, with the rocking of the waves would shift the air around in that ark, thus creating enough movement of air to keep them from dying from methane gas. Also, if that trough was built like it's built in a normal house and he had to have ventilation somehow in that roof line, that would be the most logical place. Plus, it would create ventilation for them in the ark without causing death, sickness, or any other thing coming because of all the animals within the ark. Yet this is the very thing that people want to talk about and scoff at when we start talking about Noah and the ark. The vast majority of the creatures, such as birds, reptiles, and mammals, were small. The largest would only be around two or 300 pounds in body weight. What's more, it could have housed, uh, housed these animals in groups, which would have even caused less space to be needed. You put smaller animals together, they can live together in one cage or in one section. Why could not have Noah done that? Very possible that he did. Noah probably stored the food and water near each animal. And even better, drinking water could have been piped through trawls. Oh, no, he couldn't have done that. How could they have known about trawls in Noah's day? Well, folks, the Chinese have used bamboo pipes for several thousand years to have water flowing. I don't think Noah's smart enough, or even more than that, don't you think God's smart enough to help Noah understand the things that he could do to keep them all alive? Not hard at all. Someone remarked, and matter of fact, I had a discussion with someone said, well, how could Noah have even fed all those animals? He'd have been up 24 hours a day for the entire year they were on the ark trying to feed all those animals. No, that's not necessarily true. But some of you have automatic dog feeders for your dogs. You think that's a new philosophy? Don't think Noah was smart enough he could have made automatic feeders for these animals? Some self-feeders commonly done for birds? It's been relatively easy which would have required a lot less time for Noah to have to take care of the animals. And it would have provided him enough time when caring for these animals to not run himself to death the entire time they were on ark. I mean, if he had enough food for a week or a few days or however many days or weeks he needed for a particular animal or a particular set of animals within a cage or a room, it would give him plenty of time to go around and feed all the rest of them. Plus, remember, there were seven other people on the ark, not just Noah. Well, what did Noah do with all the animal waste? And if you look in the Bible, the Bible teaches us that Noah built rooms. As God told him to build rooms, pitch them within and without with pitch. Literally, the word rooms there means nests or cages to hold the animals. You think he's going to let some of those animals just run free? No. People think, when they think of the ark, I almost think of some chaotic zoo where everything's just running where they want to within the ark. He didn't do that. He built rooms. He built cages for them. Would you want a lion running around? I know the lion came to, uh, came to Noah, but would you want a lion running around all over the place eating on all the other animals? No, you're going to put them in a cage. You're going to put them in a room. And likely exactly what Noah did. That's exactly what God told him to do in the book of Genesis. Chapter 6, verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and out with a pitch. Room shalt thou make. Nest or cages. That's what that word means. But notice this on this next slide on the picture. 
This is an artist's rendition of possibly what they could have done on some of those cages. Notice they have the cages up here. Look at the angle chute to take care of the waste. You see the trough at the bottom? Could that not have been so designed where both the urine and the feces went down that slope into this trough and would have been very easy for Noah and Miss Noah and the sons and daughter-in-laws to clean out, to wash out, or even better than that, for it to almost wash itself out, flow, if it was at a particular angle. You know it would have to be cleaned from time to time, but they could do that. Now that's just a rendition of what could have happened. We don't know, but that's pretty logical, that Noah could build something such as that. If he can build a boat, surely he can build things inside the boat to take care of the animals, couldn't he? So why do we have people scoffing at this particular situation? There's other possibilities. One possibility would be allow the waste to accumulate below the animals. Kind of like we see in modern day cages for animals in the pet shops. Do you think those people in the pet shops have to go around just every few hours cleaning out because they mess up their cages? No, they've got it where it falls through and you can slide it out and go empty it and slide it back in again. That's another possibility. In this regard, there could have been slatted floors. So the animals could have trampled their waste into, the, into pits below. What do you think we see sometimes with cattle or with other animals? You have them in certain places. They'll do that. Pigs, same way. Why well, could not have, Noah have done the same thing? Caring for these animals would not have been difficult. No special devices were needed for eight people to care for 16,000 animals. But if they existed, how would they be powered? Well, there are all sorts of possibilities for that. Again, there could have been a plumbing system with gravity-fed drinking water, a ventilation system driven by wind or even the wave motion, or hoppers that dispense grain as the animals would eat it. None of these require higher technology, and we know that these technologies existed during that time. It's through history. Noah could have implored those technologies. Well, I want to look for the next few minutes, and I don't have a lot of time left. We're going to hurry through this but some internal proofs for the global universal flood. I'll encourage you to get the book to read the rest of this. There are skeptics who balk at the idea of the worldwide flood. They want to put it to the region of Mesopotamia rather than the entire world. But Peter writes, whereby the world then was being overflowed with water, perished. The world, not the region, not the area, but the world that was overflowed with water, perished. According to God, he caused a flood to come upon the earth and destroy the entire world. But think about this. If this was only a local flood, and some people say, well, the word world could mean a region, an area. Okay, let's just use that for an example. If the word world referred to by Peter was only local, and it meant only that particular region of Mesopotamia, then according to 2 Peter chapter 3, if you follow that same philosophy, you're going to have judgment on Mesopotamia and not the rest of the world. So that means we're in America. We don't have to worry about it. You can live any way you want, do whatever you want, because God can't judge us, because he's only going to judge a section of the world, and since that's where the flood was, and that's what Peter's referring to, it has to be there where you judge. So we'll let the Jews and all those Arabs and everybody else over there be judged. We do what we want to, and God can send us to heaven without question. We're going to argue that. Now, people will argue against the worldwide flood, but they won't do something as foolish as argue about a, a local judgment and say the rest of us get a, a pass, free pass. We get that pass, you can collect your $200, get out of jail free, whatever. Don't have to worry about it. That's what you'd have to follow if you're going to follow that same type of flawed logic. The need for the ark itself was proof of the universal flood. Why would Noah spend approximately 100 to 120 years building an ark if it was a local flood? Could not have he and his family fled to another portion of the world, another region? Could they not have gone into the high mountains away from that area to escape it? Oh, look at that picture. I love that one. There's your good local flood. Good wall of water. It just stops right there on the edge and the sun's shining. It's just beautiful, isn't it? That's the kind of foolishness we see when people argue for a local flood. If it was going to be 15 cubits above the highest mountain, and notice we talked about the 15 cubits of the boat with the tonnage, it would go down almost 15 cubits in the water with the weight in it. You think God wasn't smart enough to determine when he had the floods above 15 cubits? above the highest mountain peaks so the bottom of the ark would not hit them thus destroying the ark and killing everyone inside now how can they do that and it just stop if it was a local flood no one his family would just left the area the same is true with animals why would you need animals let them run animals have pretty good instincts 
They know when the weather changes. They know when storms come. They know when to take refuge and often know where to take refuge. So why would they need even worry about animals? Let them do what they wanted to. Oh, sure, some of them would die, but there would be enough left to carry on those various species or kinds. The need for the ark is simple proof of the worldwide flood. The purpose of the flood is proof of the universal flood. We can find in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7, The Lord said, I will destroy a man from whom I created off the face of the earth, both man and beast and every creeping thing and the fowl of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. When God said, I'm going to destroy the world and everything in it, he's not talking about one section. He's talking about the entire world. But go further. The covenant that God made with man to never flood the world again with water is proof of the universal flood. Notice Genesis 9, verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more flood to destroy the earth. Now notice God's covenant. He's not going to destroy the earth again by water. Notice verses 15 and 16. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow, or rather the bow, shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh which is upon the earth. Have you seen a rainbow recently? In any, in any rainstorm maybe you've been in or seen? Seen a rainbow? Okay, and think about floods. 2008, there were a lot of floods in the Midwest. I remember seeing one of the tropical storms come through Florida. There were a lot of floods. And if anybody lived around here back in September, and it was my first hurricane, we had floods around here as well. Even as far up here as spring, the ditches were flooded. Some of the streets were flooded. I know I drove around the next day after the hurricane to see some of the damage, and I went through streets that were six to eight inches underwater. We had floods. God made a covenant never to destroy the world by water again. If that's only a local flood... He destroyed our local area. That means God would have lied if it was only a local flood. But the proof of the universal flood showed that it was not local. It was universal, just as God said it was and as he said it would be. I want to look at some of the external proofs now. There are external proofs for the universal flood. If it were not enough for a skeptic, the liberal CNN website of all people, I'm just tickled to death with them right now, at least on this particular thing, they at least have something good on there every once in a while. CNN had this back in 2000 concerning uh, the uh, region in the Black Sea. This article talks about a great flood that took place that would be considered or could be considered, quote, biblical. That's their word, not mine. They said it could be a biblical flood. Now notice this particular thing. The article first was published in September 2000, September 13th of 2000, and it says this, The first evidence that humans lived in an area not covered by the Black Sea, perhaps inundated by the biblical flood, has been found by the team of explorers. And that's on CNN.com. The remnants of human habitation were found more than 300 feet of water, about 12 miles off the coast of Turkey. That tells you that that little lake at one time that is now the Black Sea is 12 miles larger than it was during at least somebody's lifetime. Many ancient Middle Eastern cultures have legends of a great flood, including the Bible story of Noah. That's in that article. They further state, the saltwater shells date from, from the present back to 6,500 years, while the freshwater shells date to 7,000 years ago or over. Now, I know we're going to be playing with the dates a little bit, but 6,000 years, 7,000 years, is that not about pretty close to when the earth began, not too long after that that the flood came, give or take a thousand, two thousand years. They're getting very close on their dates. They have figured out something. It's like a revelation, a light came on. They've read the Bible, they'd see the revelation that's already there. So we know that there was a dramatic sudden change from freshwater lake to a saltwater sea some 7,000 years ago, he said Tuesday. And this was part of that article. Look at the evidence. Even liberal websites can have a decent article that even shows something happened. How could it go from a small lake to a large sea? Well, we know how. It was a flood. You don't have to look at the Grand Canyon as proof of a universal flood. Evolutionists have believed that it was carved out over hundreds of millions of years by the Colorado River. A further study, however, shows that this was a quick, violent upheaval of the earth which can only be explained logically by the flood of Noah's day. 
Jack Wellman documented a study that shows the Grand Canyon gives proof of the flood of Noah's day. And he said this, the top of the Grand Canyon is over 4,000 feet higher than where the Colorado River enters the canyon, meaning it would have had to flow uphill for millions of years. He continues by saying, additionally, in contrast all up to all other rivers, we do not find a delta. Now, you look at that. It did not find a delta. Anytime you have some type of area that grows the way that did, you're going to find a delta. There was no delta there. Now let's go further. I can see Ken walking around. There are geologic implications of the flood. Both creationists and evolutionists use fossils for proof. Fossils can be found on, on almost every continent and in every country. And there are facts that cannot be denied. To understand index fossils, in 1830, a man by the name of Sir Charles Lyell developed what is called a geologic column. But the problem using the geologic column and index fossils for dating is that fossils are dated by the rock layers that they are in, and the rock layers are dated by the fossils that they are in. Circular reasoning. Look how ridiculous that is. Then Wayne Jackson points out that there are other problems with this, that the column exists nowhere but on paper in those books. There's evidences of human activity seen throughout the entire geologic column, there are human footprints that have been found within dinosaur footprints at Glen Rose. I've got just a few minutes. I'm going to run through some of those. And then there's a lack of transitional fossils that would have been abundant if evolution were true. Where are your transitional fossils? Well, they were making the transition from one species to another. You'd have to have them. And if that geologic column is true, you would see a half ape, half man. You could see a half dog, half horse, or whatever it was. But they're not there. They're absent, which further proves evolution to be false. This column is nowhere but on paper in textbooks. The geologic timetable, as the column is sometimes called, is contradicted by numerous facts in the actual strata of the Earth. For example, if all theoretical geologic records of the Earth, Earth's living creatures that supposedly evolved over the span of two billion years were stacked on top of one another as a domino illustration, then the depth would be about 130 miles. But if you compare that to the Earth's crust, it's only about 25 or 30 miles, folks, not 130. And to have evolution the way they say evolution is, it'd have to be 130, not 30. They're 100 miles off somehow. They can't explain it. Then we have dinosaur tracks, as well as human tracks. The Paluxy River in Glen Rose, Texas, have dinosaur tracks found in the river. Look, this is a dinosaur. And I imagine that old dinosaur is probably running about this time, because the only way you're going to have sand or dirt fossilized that quickly is to have some catastrophic event not uniformitarianism as evolution teaches. Some catastrophic event had to freeze these tracks in time. Otherwise, they would have been washed by the water if it was sand or dirt. You had that frozen. And look here, those are man's tracks. See that man walking in those tracks? Just proving that there were man and animal on earth at the same time. But let's look at Richard Dawkins very quickly. Richard Dawkins, if you don't know him, is a nut. Sorry, Ken, he's English nut. But we've got enough American nuts around here, too. But Richard Dawkins uh, denies the global worldwide flood. Plus, he denies the Bible. He denies God. But in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, he said this. There are certain things about fossil records that any evolutionist would expect to be true. We should be very surprised, for example, to find a human fossil remains appearing uh, in the record before mammals are supposed to have been evolved. If a single, well-verified mammal skull were to turn up in a 500-million-year-old rock, our whole modern theory of evolution would be utterly destroyed. Incidentally, this is a sufficient answer to the uh, counter uh, put about by creationists and their journalistic fellow travelers that the whole theory of evolution is, is unfalsifiable tautology. Ironically, it is with this reason why creationists are so keen to, on keeping fake human footprints which are carved in the depression to fool tourists in a dinosaur bed in Texas, and he's referring to Glen Rose. He's saying that this was all fake, it never happened, and a man made that up. There was one fake human footprint found, or realized, someone did make a fake human footprint, and now all these evolutions are running with it and saying all of them were fake. So I guess that picture we saw just a moment ago, the dinosaur tracks and human tracks, that's all fake. Some man did that, and then they see them in the the uh, ground there, so it would look like it's just good hard limestone now. 
That's what he's thinking. Well, let's look at some, some things here. Notice the picture on the left. Now, this is actually a dinosaur track here in a human footprint. This is a blown-up view with a human footprint highlighted. Here's your dinosaur track, and it comes here and turns around about right there. Same strata, same time, no different. Look at the delt track, also found in Glen Rose, Texas. You see the, hum uh, the dinosaur track here? Look at that human footprint. See those big old toes stuck down where mud once was? Guess what? This is verified by a spiral CT scan. They verified this rock to be authentic, number one. It was not a fake. They've also verified this rock, in this rock, that both footprints were made at relatively the same time, not 50 million years difference. That's what evolution tries to teach. That's not a fake rock. That is an authentic track of both human and dinosaur footprint, and they cannot explain it. Now, these are just some further dinosaur tracks that have been found. Are these all falsified? No. Well, I want to close with this. Now, notice I like, I like Mother Goose and Grimm anyway, but I found this little cartoon. And it says, although someday Grimzilla will be extinct, his tracks will forever remain. And look at Grimm running through the cement. And it's not going to take but a few minutes for that to settle and be hardened. You think that's the way those tracks are made? Somebody poured a bunch of cement? and they all stepped in them, or they made some fake dinosaur tracks and had a man run through them? No, it didn't. It took place in the dirt, in the sand, and when the worldwide flood came and the great upheaval took place, it forever sealed these tracks. Not only that, there are fossil beds all over the world containing not only human remains, but containing animal remains, both mammal, reptile, and your aquatic animals. You have your marine mammals, sharks, plesiosaurs, chronosaurs, your dinosaurs, dogs, deer, elephants, all in one bed. How do you think they got there? You see, on ev as a story of evolution, some of those animals were not even around at the same time. How did they get in the same bed? How did man get in the same fossil bed graveyard with them? If the Bible is not true, then they'll have some type of explanation. But the story of Noah and the flood just verifies why we see those fossil graveyards. I do thank you for your time and for your attention today. Interesting that the uh, evolutionist, when pointed out to them that the uh, uh, links are missing, that they would maintain that uh, that evolution happened over so long a period of time and so very slowly that the uh, links just don't, uh, have not remained. Well, that sort of specious uh, argumentation uh, was recognized as such by some evolutionists, so they came up with this uh, punctuated equilibrium where uh, species would maintain status quo for millennium and then all of a sudden there would be a, a sudden burst in the evolutionary uh, uh, process, uh, yet you still can't find missing links. So you have a situation where you know evolution is, has been so slow that you can't find the links, or it's been so fast that you can't find the links, but you can't find the links. So uh, this is just another uh, set of evidence that evolution is uh, false. So we appreciate that, John, and and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, you, you bringing your good wife here. <laughs> we'll uh, adjourn until the bottom of the